All right, hello and welcome to the Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Carmen Perry, who is the co-founder of Kula Partners. Uh, how are you doing, Carmen? Okay, I'm doing great, John. It's good to be chatting with you. Yeah, and where are you today? What part of the world? I am in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Wow, lovely. A lovely part of the world. I've never been there, but actually my sister visited there quite recently and sent a lot of fabulous pictures. It looked like it's an, an incredible place. You know, it uh, it has its charms for sure. Especially <laughs> here. And uh, and where are you uh, joining uh, from? I should ask. I'm joining from San Diego. Uh, I'm originally from Ireland, but San Diego is where I'm based. So I was going to say that is not a San Diego accent that I'm hearing. It's, it's not. It's not because I, I didn't say dude five times in that <laughs> sentence. <laughs> so we have our surf culture here. So yeah, you could go to a doctor, you could go to an attorney and they'll still be, they'll still be dropping dude in the conversation. <laughs> I can, uh, I can think of worse. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, uh, you lead, uh, you're lead marketing and sales, sales uh, council to firms, uh, you know, across North America in manufacturing. Uh, and one of the things that we wanted to talk today with you about Carmen is this idea of this concept of some fatal flaws in the funnel and why salespeople need to be marketers. And I know for the salespeople listening, they're all going, Oh, I don't want to be a marketer. What, what are you talking about? So, uh, Explain yourself. <laughs> yeah. Well, first off, I think it's interesting to me how certain models that we use or ways that we think about things or just frame certain discussions really impact um, the outcome of them. Or, you know, they have far reaching ramifications. And the one that, <clears throat> excuse me, that's really taken hold in the last number of years. Uh, pervasive across both marketing and sales is this notion of a funnel. Mm -hmm. um, and man, I mean, uh, the notion of inbound marketing really brought that to the fore. Um, uh, but it's not exclusive to that, of course. And it just occurred to me that with most of the clients that I work with, you know, complex B2B uh, sales environments, 18 month, two year long sales cycles, uh, they don't have a funnel. It's not the no, uh, this notion of, of this unlimited top mm -hmm. of funnel of just this massive number of people that you could possibly touch with your marketing and then bring down into a marketing qualified lead, a sales qualified lead, et cetera. They just didn't really exist. Like the fact is there's like 2000 companies in the world that can buy what they sell. Mm -hmm. um, so it led me to the thought that really, Framing the conversation through the lens of a funnel was causing a whole lot of, well, on the marketing side, it's causing a whole lot of misdirected effort, uh, mm -hmm. misdirected spend on traffic attraction uh, often, um, misreported metrics from a marketing perspective in terms of what really matters versus the vanity metrics that so often get reported. But it has very far-reaching ramifications on the sales side as well. I think for salespeople, it's really meant that well, I, I was chatting with a, a a VP of sales the other day, and it was interesting to me. He, he well, it was interesting to me probably because he was really agreeing with me at the time. Uh, he, but he said, he goes, he goes, you tell me the funnel's broken. And he goes, that's exactly what I think when I look at 2% of my MQLs turning into SQLs. Mm -hmm. Like there's something fundamentally broken, yep. if that's the case. And so often that is the case, right? You have marketing going on a bit of a hamster wheel to create MQLs. <laughs> and then sales, meanwhile, is sitting down receiving these leads thinking, well, only 2% of them are turning into opportunities. It's all a waste of time. Yeah. So I, um, a number of years ago, I coined the phrase, the feel good funnel. Because I think that's exactly what you're talking about is sometimes it's great. If you're, if you're in the middle of, uh, uh, you know, say you're in the middle of Q4 right now and you're going, ooh, things aren't looking that good right now or this month or next month. But look at stage one of the funnel. There's so many opportunities in there. So, so listen, uh, Mr. Sales Manager, don't worry about this month and next month. I'm going to have a blowout December or a blowout January because of all this stuff in the pipeline. And of course, when December and January comes around, I'm going, well, I'm going to have a blowout March because, yeah, those things didn't materialize, but I've got even more 
at the beginning of the pipeline in the top mm. of the funnel right now. So I think we've, you're absolutely 100% correct. I think we've created this strange world of stuffing the funnel full of stuff to make us feel good. Yeah. And, you know, on this, in a world where um, salespeople are 100% responsible for their own lead gen, um, what you just said would be, uh, well, that's it, that's all. But in, in, in most cases, uh, we have a marketing team in charge of generating those top of funnel leads that everybody's feeling good about in the funnel, but actually aren't going anywhere. It yep. means that there's a whole lot of people wasting their time. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So, so now that we're in violent what's, agreement, what's, we can't yeah, uh, have nothing to do. What's the end? What's the exactly? Oh, this is fun. What's well, the antidote? Well, the other the other problem with the the funnel is that it engages people, uh, engages salespeople. Oftentimes, the most important uh, I don't say the most important, but certainly often the highest priced talent in the sale. Mm-hmm. Um, it engages them at a point where they're not particularly useful. Um, by the time a lead is actually SQL. Um, they're oftentimes well down the buying process and outside of the reach often of really meaningful sales influence to help shape a procurement process. Mm-hmm. So I feel the lesson in this in reverse in some way, or the anecdote, if you will, is for salespeople uh, to find ways to move, if we're going to stick with the funnel terminology forever so briefly, to, for salespeople to find ways to move up funnel for them to be more active in the role of marketing uh, the organization in some way, shape, or form. I mean, you see this, um, whether it's salespeople being involved in things like webinars or podcasts mm-hmm. or what have you, and uh, co-creating content with customers or prospects. Um, uh, but even in uh, maybe uh, higher-end consulting professional services firms, you see an even further blending of this where your sales leads are often also the key thought leaders, yeah. say, the firm. Like a like a Deloitte or something like that. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's I think that's a that's a great point, and I think uh, it's one thing salespeople do need to you know be more attuned to. And I think in some ways, to be honest, I think the whole language uh, uh, and nomenclature like of marketing qualified lead and then sales qualified lead, in some ways, that I think has added to the issue because it should really be a qualified lead, right? And because of this these kind of artificial demarcations, it allows for this breakdown. So I totally agree with you about the salesperson moving further up. And I think it should, I think we we need to get away from these, you know, kind of artificial demarcations because I don't think they serve us. Well, especially for those organizations that have a very limited universe that they can Mm -hmm. sell into. Um, It's not a question of whether or not somebody's marketing qualified or sales qualified. You know they're qualified before they ever come through the door where Mm -hmm. you ought to if you only have a possible universe of five or 10,000 people to sell to. Um, It's about whether or not, um, you know, where they are in a discovery process and how you can engage with it at that particular Mm -hmm. time. It's once they're into your world, you can deal with it from there. But this notion of, of yeah, the, these like you say, these artificial demarcations don't really um, serve us. Um, yeah, and the lines have become blurred, and that's what I, I like what you were saying about, you know, that the that the real information, thought leadership, or whatever. I mean, sometimes it does uh, exist with the salespeople, and and they need to figure out a way of being able to leverage that more and working more collaboratively with marketing. So as I said, like this, just kind of teaming in a more, you know, robust fashion. It's funny, I haven't met a marketer who isn't um, really hungry for sales collaboration and sales Mm -hmm. support. I would say I've met salespeople that are hungry for it in reverse. Um, Yeah, so why do you think that is? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's easy to be contrary and just look at the, some of the lone wolf kind of attitude of sales. Um, but I don't know. Um, I think it's really organization dependent, probably. That really, yeah, I, I do. But I think also sometimes I, I think this without getting into generalizations, but I think sometimes uh, some salespeople don't really understand marketing or don't understand the value of, of marketing, maybe are reluctant to bring them in because they, 
they don't really understand their value or their, and you know, sales people are often worried about bringing other people into their world anyway, because they're afraid they're going to screw something up. Mm. Yeah, but it, it's, um, I look at uh, every marketer, I would probably say that one of the big pieces of, of advice I can give them would be get some sales experience. It'll make you a better marketer. Um, and I think I would also say that in reverse for salespeople, get some marketing experience, become integrated um, with the marketing side of the organization. And it'll make you a better salesperson. Yeah. So if you were, if, if, if there was a salesperson watching this and said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to this. I'm going to dip my toe into doing a little bit more marketing. Where, where do you think they should start? Where'd be a good place to start? Uh, I, I think they should start with uh, going and talking to the marketing team and saying, um, what content can I be a part of helping to create with our prospects, with people that we want to sell to eventually that we don't even know who they are today, but we can go out and find out who they are. Um, and let's let's find some sort of marketing vehicle um, that that works for that. So, and like in today's content creation environment, there's any number of things you can do. I think the that that's open only to your or limited only by your mm-hmm. imagination. But um, I think salespeople have a lot of knowledge that they can bring into that world, and yeah. I think it's an opportunity for a salesperson to really develop a personal brand in the, that moment as well, and to begin to to exercise leadership in a different kind of way. Um, I, I just can't imagine as a salesperson why you wouldn't want to take that initiative, uh, particularly if you're early in your career and looking to make a mark. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, that's one great one as well is the personal branding, because I think it does a lot marketing can help with, uh, you know, with getting that, getting you all the assets and needed to have a, to have a wow brand on LinkedIn or whatever. And uh, I think that's a really good place to start. I also think it's a great place to start uh, with, you know, customer testimonials and stuff, because once you engage marketing with your customer to get a testimonial, and then that's something that you can use in your sales process. It really does start to bring sales and marketing together a lot more, I think. It always surprises me, I must say, as an agency guy for so many years, how hard it is um, for clients to get customer testimonials. Mm -hmm. Often marketers just won't ask the sales team. Sales team just won't respond to the email. Something, but there's always like the, there's always a dog ate my homework reason yeah. why someone doesn't want to get the customer talking about whether or not they enjoyed this the, the process, and you know almost always. I mean, these are you know companies that have been around for a very long time. They have a very strong track record. One would have to assume they serve clients very well. They have no reason to be afraid of such a dialogue. But here we yeah. are. No, I th- yeah, and, and I agree with you. And I think it's sometimes again. I think it goes back to that fear of. Uh, well, if it ain't broke, uh, don't fix it. It's like, don't bring somebody and don't let engage, you know, I, maybe I don't want them to start talking to my customer because maybe something will come up, you know, maybe <laughs> be, by actually having this conversation, something will come up that maybe would be better left alone. So I think sometimes there's a bit of fear in it. Sometimes I think it just falls to the bottom of the list of priorities. But the yeah. fact is, what do, what do your prospects ask you for pretty much uh, 100% of the time? They're going to ask you for referrals and testimonials, and they want to see some stuff. So that's the vital, vital importance of them. Yeah, and and you say if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Of course, like, but but of course it is broke when yeah. <laughs> you have those testimonials because you you know you go onto the websites of those companies and you you see these kind of fake air quote testimonials <laughs> by you know customer X or something like yeah. Rob Z from Nashville said like. Um, <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. yeah who yeah. seems to, yeah. Who seems to get around a lot? Cause I think I saw him from Atlanta and then from somewhere else yeah, a few days ago. On another exactly. Website. With the stock photo uh, representing yeah, the yeah. supposed customer. But it is so obvious, of course, in reverse, when you go on, uh, uh, regardless if it's a B2B or B2C mm-hmm. purchase or what have you, when you're on a website and you see an authentic testimonial, I mean, it's, 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 it's obvious from the minute you encounter it and the, the level of trust that it uh, adds is exponential, really. Yeah, and then a, a level above that, the gold standard is if you can get the customer to do a video testimonial, because that's when somebody is really, I mean, the the written case study and testimonial is great. The video testimonial is gold because somebody has actually put themselves out there. There's a face to it and everything. And I think that's becoming more prevalent. Uh, you know, we have some customers who've done that for, for us at Pipeliner recently, and it's Again, it's it's you're amazed. You'd be amazed what happens when you ask, right? 
Uh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> look, that's a, that's, that's great advice. I, I think we're, we're too often afraid. It's funny you say we started that with this conversation saying I was from Halifax mm-hmm. near San Diego. I often, uh, any of our clients who aren't American, um, Americans, if you're talking to a Canadian, Americans have a reputation of maybe being a bit more direct. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, when it comes to business. So I always encourage my Canadian clients to be more American. Uh, to <laughs> don't be afraid to ask. Now when I'm talking to the guy from San Diego, it maybe doesn't translate as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, maybe not. But but it is. It, it is amazing that how uh, how often we, I mean, it's in human nature, how often we already answer no before we've ever asked the question. We go, oh, well, yeah, Carmen's not going to do that. So I'm not, oh, I won't even ask him. And you may actually not just do that. You might say, video interview, well, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do video testimonial. But but I never know if I don't ask. And yeah. I think it's a fantastic, as I said, I think it's a fantastic way of bringing sales and marketing together because it's it's an area of where they both need each other. And the the upside of it is huge for both. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. The only, um, if I'm just being... Yeah, uh, eye on the prize here a bit. I would say it's going to help us on our close rate, of course, but it's not going to help us find net new uh, prospects, mm-hmm. which is where that content co-creation that we mentioned earlier and getting sales involved more up funnel, so so to speak, mm-hmm. that it can really assist. Um, so a combination of those two things should really help people out. Yeah, absolutely. No, I I, I agree completely. And uh, I mean, the good thing about uh, about salespeople is that they have so much experience and so many stories to tell. But they've so much experience of working with uh, you know customers in the same industry or in the same you know in the same vertical or this whatever it is, and they have information that nobody else has because very few people have that kind of wider view. So they they have such a rich. Uh, a rich reservoir of things that they could talk about. So they just, so that's where marketing could help them bring some of that expertise alive. Yeah, absolutely. And marketing can learn along the way of how to uh, speak uh, in a language that resonates more because of course the salesperson has been at it for any length of time has been successful at it. They've learned how to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. For sure. For sure. Um, so what other thing, what other piece of advice would you give uh, to salespeople? I mean, we're, again, we're in Q4 now for a lot of people it's the, uh, who, are on fis- who are on calendar fiscals. Um, so what, can, what, do you, what advice would you have to salespeople, what you can do in the, to end the year strongly? Well, look, I think you pointed to it earlier. If you're going to end the year strongly, that probably started six months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think... Uh, <laughs> Sometimes the Hail Mary pass now to say, what can I do to close X, Y, or Z in the next 60 days is probably, um, in, in most cases, probably a misdirected effort. Because um, uh, I think in some ways, part of our conversation about moving sales more out funnel is to take them out of the notion of I'll always be closing and getting them into more of the notion of working with prospects before they actually have an opportunity. So, I think we may be at risk of talking out of both sides of our mouths if we try to get <laughs> forward advice at this point. Yeah, well, um, it wouldn't be the fir- it wouldn't be the first time for me. So there, uh, but uh, but, but I do. I, I mean, I, I do more advice, and I'm going to say, pick up the phone. I'll go yeah. back to that. Like, and I, and I think that's a really strong piece of advice because I think now is uh, again there's that reluctance, but I think it is like pick up the phone and just one last you know you never know one last call to that person who may have gone quiet on you or whatever you just never know. Uh, it's certainly not going to harm. Yeah, any um, anybody that's been persistent in a sales process for any length of time has been rewarded at mm-hmm. some point and has a story about that, whether it's. You know, I just made that one last call at six o'clock before I left for the day, and then I finally got to connect. Um, I don't know. I mean, I always remember like the first time you get the phone call back from the uh, batch of cold calls, right. you're and somebody actually phones you back from a voicemail. You're like, "What? Mm-hmm. Nobody phones anybody." Back. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. There you go. Pick up the phone. That's always timeless advice. As long yeah, as yeah. It, it, it really is. Uh, and unfortunately, though, the people do need a reminder uh, because you've got so many tools in front of you that, that can help you avoid picking up the phone. So it's always a good reminder. Yeah, exactly. We just have the stuff to distract us. Um, yeah. it's, uh, it's an easy thing to do, and it's hard to convince yourself to do it. Exactly. All right, listen, Carmen, this is fascinating. Before we go, uh, I'd like to just tell people a little bit more about yourself, your company, and how they can learn more about you. 
Hey John, um, yeah, so uh, the company's Cooler Partners. We are a marketing agency uh, that really helps manufacturers transform uh, their marketing and sales apparatus digitally. So um, uh, very often what that means is that we help uh, folks either on um, uh, building a digital foundation from which that marketing and sales um, uh, charge can be, be led from, or even helping on various aspects of uh, on the marketing side or even on sales enablement and how it all ties together. So that's what we do. Um, you can find out more at coolapartners.com, K-U-L-A partners.com. And uh, we'd love to have you uh, check us out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is John Golden, sales from online sales magazine, Pipeline CRM. See you all for another expert insight interview really soon. Again, thanks to Carmen for joining us from all the way up there in uh, Halifax. See you all, all right. again soon. Pleasure.